Hello, Perfites, and welcome to another episode where, well, I know that we haven't uh, done an episode in quite a bit, but um, we had some activity from Star, West, Star East, if you remember, Mark and I were having some action uh, there where we were sharing some knowledge around the workshops that were presented. And speaking of Star East, I had the opportunity uh, to meet the amigo Theron Melrose. I hope that I'm pronouncing <laughs> the name right. Uh, yeah. How are you, Theron? I'm doing great. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing good. Um, lots of fun as usual, lots of activities, and happy to have you here. And Yeah, it's been, it's been a while since Star East back in, what, May of, May of this year, so a couple months back, so it's really great to see you again. Yeah, when uh, everyone watching, uh, when we met, uh, Theron was giving a talk at uh, Star East. He participated on the panel. If you are curious, check uh, the Perfites channel and look for the Star East panel where uh, Theron was uh, contributing to the discussions that were happening. And, well, we agreed to kind of invite him to the show and give some of his, share his performance knowledge. But... Before we jump into the um, meat of the topic today, well, topics, because I'm sure that we are going to be talking a lot of things. Um, Amigo Theron, would you mind sharing with the audience uh, what's your background, uh, what got you here, what got you to Star East, uh, how was, um, what's your story? <laughs> yeah, yeah, glad, glad to. Uh, again, as, as Leandro mentioned, I'm Theron Melrose. I'm from uh, State Farm uh, Insurance Company, financial industry as well. And um, I, I, I the, how I got to how I got to to Star East was a roundabout way of um, because I'm in the I'm in the IT industry with State Farm. I'm in, I've been in testing for more than a decade. Um, spent the last five years or so focusing a lot, you know, solely on uh, performance testing. I manage a performance testing team here. Um, we work in the digital area, right? So think of, of uh, StateFarm.com. Um, our mobile sites as well, um, and then all the products and components that make up those those kinds of products. Each have different products that we do performance testing for. I have a fairly small team, six, seven people, uh, kind of rotates here and there, but we do testing for about 20 different teams at different times. So it, it's a way of really, you know, as we move from waterfall to agile, uh, moved from project management to, to product management, we had to really kind of tailor our 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 testing patterns and whatnot and, and what we offer for performance testing. And that's, that's what really what got me to uh, star East is I, I wrote a uh, presentation that had to do with just what I mentioned, moving, you know, a big organization moving from project management, right? So everything with a waterfall delivery pattern and we, you know, we are running hundreds of projects around here a year, um, moving to product management where you now have teams, you know, you don't have separate teams building a product and set separate teams owning and servicing a product. Mm -hmm. You have one product team that builds and services as well. Right. So, so that's what that, that took a different approach. And then we moved from waterfall to agile at about the same time. So really a challenge. So I wrote a presentation for star East that had to do with both of those things. What project was the title of the presentation? Uh, it was called a, a journey to, um, <laughs> you put me on a spot here. I almost forgot. Um, <laughs> I, it, had, it had to do, I can't remember the exact, it had to do with, with uh, a transformation to agile, uh, agile performance testing basically was it. So, so just really telling a story of how we moved from one to another and how we got there, what we had to change, what we had to do differently to performance test, um, you know, agile versus every team going waterfalls so like that. So um, that's, that's how I got there. That's, you know, my background is, is you know, been, again, a lot of testing here at State Farm. Um, but I really thought that, hey, I had a pretty decent story to tell. I thought a lot, there's a lot of companies out there struggling probably, uh, you know, how to do things differently as you go to Agile. Um, you know, as we, Leandro, as we saw at Star East, we even met teams there that still are doing waterfall development, right? And they're still running projects. And they even um, call it Agile, that they are doing Agile and we're trying to bring down the system on every sprint. Of, what? Right, <laughs> right, right. As you have, we've, we've talked, right? It's uh some companies think uh, putting something into production every six months is pretty agile. Uh, we put some things in weekly. We put things in two or three times a month, um, a little bit closer to what I think most think true agile is. 
Yeah, that's that's a big uh, difference and uh, pretty um, still impressive for me that many organizations are still thinking or struggling to truly get into agile and not to mention yeah. to get into um, agile performance, which is a it's a quite a switch of mindset on how to pull that off and um, very much aligned to some of the things that we were discussing in the panel, discussing in uh, your presentation. Mine had to do with that as well. But uh, one question that just popped in my head, how long have you been doing performance and how did that start? I, I mean, I was certainly exposed to performance testing, um, you know, the better part of 10 years ago. My, I'm, I'm actually running on this, this performance team about for about the last five years. So, so it really got started. Uh, you know, I was had several different leadership jobs here at State Farm. And then uh, about five years ago, we went through a organizational change, if you will, a, a reorg. And I just happened to land with in an area that, hey, you know, these we need we need somebody to run a performance testing team and you're it. So uh, <laughs> really by luck, by chance a little bit. But, you know, a great opportunity for me to kind of dig. I already had a testing background, like functional testing, a great opportunity for me to dig in and learn a lot more about performance testing. I hired some people who really know how to do it really know what they're talking about. I get the opportunity to meet people like you and people in the industry who who really get down deeper than I can, to be honest, um, in the performance testing uh, pieces and uh, just really know the industry tools better than I do. But but just got I got a lot of exposure over the past five years or so to different techniques, different tools, yeah. people that know this well. And then as, as we've talked about, now it's shifting again because we're going to cloud, right? It's on the cloud journey. And now there's more to learn here. There's more, there's going to be different ways to do it. There's, uh, as you we talked about, there's some misconceptions maybe that need to correct it in the industry. So there's a, it, I, it just seems like there's no opportunity for me to end, mm -hmm. uh, stop learning about what's coming next. That's, I think, the, pretty much the uh, story of any IT person that wants to stay relevant and keep learning what uh, is coming up. But it's as well, it, it, I find it super funny because most of the people that I uh, have interviewed that are performance testers, it's like the hot potato. Here, performance, you have it. And then you start to <laughs> become a specialist or understand it better or learn how to do it. It's um, most of the time a destiny indication or you are set on the track and that's it. Now you're a performance engineer and you got to figure things out, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, seen, I've seen it happen that way. Yeah, I mean, you are also, I'm, I, I'm myself and I'm another testament of that situation. Yeah. And super interesting <laughs> that um, you mentioned you getting into the testing in general and performance testing trade when we were just getting out of the waterfall trend, getting out of these um, methodologies that still many organizations cannot um, catch up very well with uh, this right. continuous and product-oriented mm -hmm. rather than project-oriented. Yeah. I, had, I yeah. hadn't heard that uh, distinction before. I love it because it explains that it's not, I'm done with the project this space and I'm out. No, it's a product okay. and I kind of keep working on it and pro improving it and working through it. And yeah, cloud now it's adding like a little bit of a, uh, pepper or spices on top of what was continuous and agile. And that, what what I wonder, uh, I, what was your experience when you started? Uh, what were the key characteristics or things that you had to learn that I, probably now you have to unlearn because um, yeah. I think there are a few of those. Well, I, you're right. There are a few. And, and and a couple of them I even learned from you when, when we met at Star East. <laughs> You know, because when I first started, right, to me, performance <laughs> testing was load testing. I mean, that's yeah. what it was. It was just load it, try to break it, throw it in an environment and 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 then report back to that project team before they put it into implementation. Hey, it, it, it did well at this level and this level, but it broke here. It, but to your point, it's a different it's a different approach now. Um, I think it's a different approach now because that's that's not the only kind of testing we should do. Um, in the product space, in the agile space, I mean, I think of it this way, like in an agile space, right? If you're doing agile, right. And you're doing many more implementations per year, right. Per month, whatever you're, you're doing, you're taking smaller bites of code. You're that you're changing. Whoop. You're still there. Yeah. 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 All good. I'm sorry. I got to log back on and missed you. Um, 
Sorry. <laughs> computer died. Um, computer no worries. Time died. Those lo um, look out. Yeah. But I think for um, in Agile, you're taking smaller bites at a time, right? Because you're putting in, you know, you're putting in smaller, smaller changes, basically. So, so you have more to test more frequently, but um, so you're not maybe not looking to break this, no. the system Wait. every time. You're looking to test impacts from those minor changes, maybe that you're putting in. Yeah. Maybe they're major, and you do have to do some more extensive testing. But I, not all the tests. I mean, and, and you and I talked about this too. Not all, not all changes require performance yeah. testing, right? And that's where the product, to me, that's where the product ownership is key, because when, when that team that does the development and they do the support, they own that. They own that product to the point where um, they get to make their decisions on what gets performance tested and what doesn't need performance tested. And you even challenged me a little bit because I said some <laughs> UI changes, some UI changes don't require performance testing, but clearly some do, right? Absolutely, some do, and you, you gotta be careful. But we leave it up to the team to decide and tell us, hey, what what is it you need tested? What do you think? Because again, they, they, could make, they could make so many changes and they know which ones are, are, are critical. They know which ones need tested. They might know what other ones don't need to. Hey, we've, we've changed that 50 times in the past two years. We're confident about that. You don't need to perform this test. Spend your time here instead. It's so. Uh, it's a multi front perspective now. And um, I think we had this discussion. I'm super happy when you say that it's a small bites and chunks that you have to continuously test and be checking that uh, they arrive well. We have this MVP or production already rolling. So yeah. why, if you know the capacity of production, why obsess about trying to push it on every uh, sprint if it's so um, pointless, in my uh, yeah. uh, opinion? You may have some situations when you want to push it to um, the, the its limits, but most of the time it's like, yeah, I'm just releasing new little bites and all I want to know is if this affected any others or is a slower or anything like that. And right. I don't know, have you noticed or experienced any differences now as well that the software is not um, monolithic, uh, thick front end or how are your automations nowadays? How do you work through them? Are they still with lots of variable session variables or more service oriented? Yeah. Um... I, I mean, we don't have a lot of thick client uh, applications I anymore. So, um, I, 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 you're, you're digging a little deeper on me that I probably <laughs> can answer too confidently. But, but, but you know, we leave it up to the product teams. Let me just say that. I mean, you know, the product teams know their product. Right? We have a testing team that tries to get to know these products as well as the product team, but probably will never know it just wow. as well as they do. But we work with the developers. We work with the product owners, and we work with them. We have meetings before they. Right when they set out to a uh, uh, plan a sprint of work, we're, we're there in the beginning, and we're and we're there and, and we're working with them to try to help us figure out what do we need to performance test for this sprint before you put it in. And now it's possible we could um, they could run two or three sprints and then implement at the end of that third sprint potentially. Right, so it's not maybe uh, performance testing every sprint and then right before you, you know and implement every sprint, but you might you might performance test two or three of those sprints before they put it in a little bit later. But, um, but we, we, you know, we have to count on, to answer your question, we have to count on the product team knowing their product and knowing um, the ins and outs and, you know, what the impacts of a thick client, thin client solution is. So we can test, you know, we, and, but, I, but I also look for my team to come in and make some solid recommendations. And hey, if we over test a little bit, we still try to fit that into their, you know, their timeline. If we over test, we over test, right? I mean, that's that's not always a bad thing. Uh, I worry more worry more about under testing than over testing, but um, it, it's a tough call. But but it's it's I, th I think the most important there part is is that my team's interaction with the product teams and having those conversations about performance, about the changes you're putting into that next sprint, and what are those impacts going to be? For example, we got teams upgrading from Java eight to Java eleven. Well, we found that. Java 11 is a memory hog. So we've had to adjust memory as those teams go. And they don't know that until they get there. We've actually prevented outages because we have teams moving from 8 to 11 and said, hey, before you go to 11, adjust your memory to this because we think you're going to have a, an issue in production. We think we've, we've saved a few, uh, prevented a few production outages just by just by some little, little thing like that. 
Uh, quick question there. How did you detect it that uh, the newer Javas were memory hawks? You know, we, we, we had, we had, unfortunately had an outage or two. And when we would get in and dig in with our tools, we would find that, yep, it was a, it was a lack of, of memory. Um, and that's what caused your outage. So we started changing it in our, in our performance testing environment, seeing better results. And then we told one team, hey, we told one team, you know, that it was having the issue, try, try adjusting your memory. It worked. Um, we found it on several other ones. And so again, good trending, right? You see something in a trend, you're like, Hey, this works. So let's start spreading the message on this. So mm -hmm. I, I really feel good about that finding that that was something that my team helped, fi helped find on a couple product teams that were struggling with it. We were able to spread the word. And again, I think we prevented a few other outages. So right. progress. <laughs> and, and for, for the performers, uh, watching the show that want to find out what, uh, type of products were you using to detect these, um, memory consumptions and, um, yeah, we use, we use Dynatrace, we use, uh, Grafana, um, load runner for scripting and whatnot. So, but Dynatrace is, you know, it's a product that, that we use here. And again, we've been using other tools for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is one that we've just recently allowed, allowed us to dig in a little bit better at the code level. To find out uh, to find out things just like this and, and see these things, the best you know, no matter what tool you use, to be honest, the best part is is that you know we can look at some of this stuff while our product teams don't even know we're looking at, it, right? We can see, you know, because it's all instrumented for each product, we can see some of this stuff. We actually do like some proactive reviews for them and then provide them with the results later on and say, here, here's what we found. And again, to me, one of the best part about it is we're not taking that product team's time to look for that stuff. We're, we're doing it and then we're showing it to them. Um, now I had to fight a little bit of a, uh, you know, people thought, Hey, well, is this kind of people, is this an audit or are you, are you looking at my stuff without me knowing about it? We're like, look, we're, we're looking at it. We're going to present you with some options. And that product team again, owns that decision-making right to me. Uh, and that's a key factor of this is just to let them, um, Hey, here's what we found. You guys make the decision on what you want, what you want to change. The memory was just a, a that was a, just a good example of something that we found on one, and and it ended up being a solution for at least a few times there. So. It's it's interesting uh, when you mentioned that uh, some of the teams were uneasy about you. It sounds like spying on them or their software, but it's a yeah. big principle of observability. Blah, 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 take two observability uh, yeah. that everyone knows what is happening hardware wise or process-wise in your systems, as long as you don't have like uh, private data happening or visible there. But yeah. why do you think where they they were uneasy about the teams knowing their performance? You know, I, I we just got a few people came, you know, came back to us and said, so so you're going to do this and you, we don't, you, we're not involved. And I'm like, look, don't, I don't want you to get, I don't want you to get, you know, scared about this because we're not here to point out your faults or anything. I said, our, we have, you know, the goal we have is just continuous performance, right? Our, the goal we have is to, to keep you up and we don't want outages. Right. So that's, that's the reason, that's the reason for this. That's why we're doing these things. And so, so the tactic I took Leandro was to, in a meeting we had with all of our leadership is to share this with them and say, Hey, this is what we're going to do. Um, each team could come back to me and tell me, you know, if they had concerns, but I didn't really have that. So, uh, I think it was at a lower level that, that I got some of those concerns, but, um, but I shared it with them, communicate with them, was very transparent about the fact that we're going to do these and then we're going to meet with your team and, and we're going to share it with you. And again, we're going to give you these results. You can take it, take it or leave it, or to, you know, take the results. Um, and do something with them. You know, we hope we find value. We hope we find something valuable for you. We hope we're a, we're an input for you to help you improve performance, especially as te teams keep making changes now and then. Hey, man, sometimes every once in a while you got to stop and you got to stop and say, hey, do we do we change anything that might cause a problem down the road? Um, so I, I just hope that they they were all open to that. And we've done several of them this year already, and they're they're kind of you know they're manual intensive. They got a lot of data to look at and whatnot, but. Uh, um, have, we've had really good results. So that's kind of a new service that my team does when, when we're not doing active performance testing, we're doing these types of production reviews or kind of proactive reviews. Um, it's just, to me, it's another service that our performance testing team can provide. If, if let's say the performance active performance testing goes a little slow on us, we, we go, we go do something more proactive as well. That's, that's a great perspective. And, uh, I would say a way to, um, 
convince teams to not to feel uneasy is like it's a blameless game it's not i'm not trying to no. point fingers or find faults that you did or something yeah problems with the system that we can all improve for the sake of the team your product or whatever is being worked and it's really good that it's been looked as um well probably i'm not sure an alternative to not to doing automations and just this is observability monitoring of real life scenarios and situations happening because we are agile now and they are releasing new things probably with this continuous service of observability um they may identify like hey uh two sprints ago you were doing better and now you did something let's dig dig, <laughs> dig into it right do you absolutely do a lot yeah. of that now yeah and, and i mean if you think about it like so so i'm in an area that that's <laughs> that's customer facing right i'm talking uh -huh. website uh, mobile apps are so we're customer facing our uptime required uptime is like 99 and a half percent so Whoa. can we really afford outages i mean th think of any company right that that take their performance testing or sorry their their performance or their, their their customer facing channels who can really afford much downtime with your customer facing mm -hmm. channels so um that's why to me it's doubly important for those especially for those components that have customer facing uh pieces why would you not want a helping hand? Why would you not somebody not want somebody in the background monitoring your stuff now and then, at least periodically, uh, to make sure that you you know you got a better chance at having meeting those availability targets threshold. That that's that's really important. And I'm I I almost uh, tripped saying that, uh, especially with customer facing uh, products, but. Probably it's important with most of the products that we may be supporting to have this type of um, visibility and instrumentation. I know, and when you mentioned that it's an interesting task to dig into the traces, the logs, and to find out what yeah. is the source of the problem, you're almost like getting your uh, a detective hat and a pipe with a uh, magnifying glass trying to figure out where's the bottleneck, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that. That it feels like that sometimes. Um, but again, I, I, as you said, like be transparent about it. Hopefully, we're all on the same team here. Um, you know, another thing that we do, Leandro. Uh, uh, so, in addition to just our performance testing, um, and then and then we we you know we we talked about setting up dashboards and alerting and things like that. We do that as well, and then we do this production review type of thing where it's you know kind of an audit feel to it. Um, if we get into these scenarios, like, again, think about these scenarios where you have many teams, maybe you're a small testing team like we are, you've got multiple teams that you're working with and somebody contacts you a little too late and says, hey, we're going in Friday and it's Wednesday of a holiday week like this week for us. And can can you do some testing before us before we go out on Friday, right? Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. We're not that big of a team, so so we can't write all, you basically just set everything else aside and get your stuff done. The other, the other service we offer is kind of like performance monitoring. So, so you might put a change in that we either can't test at all, we can't test fully, can't test everything. We'll just kind of watch it in production for a while, for a couple of weeks maybe, and just report back to you and say, hey, here's what we're, here's what we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and if we're seeing anything that's kind of heading downhill, missing a threshold or something like that, we at least get them. It may, it maybe it doesn't. Hopefully, it doesn't cause an outage, but just cause some slow response times or whatever. Um, degradation or something that's something we can report back to the product team as well so hey if we if we didn't get the chance to do all the proper things before you went to production we're at least going to help you out by looking at it as you go into production and watching it and then reporting back to you in a week or two that's uh, uh, a key component on because um, sometimes when we have like a performance centralized uh, team or uh, performance center of excellence or something like that yep it's uh, difficult to kind of service all the teams and some of these modern uh, mindsets of enabling uh, this uh, observability. Because to me, in my um, personal and very non-respectable opinion, observability is part of performance testing. You are testing and finding out what is the performance of the application. And it's really important. That's a very good practice that you have it uh, in, in your products. And it pops in my head a curiosity. Do you guys have um, monitoring these APMs and observability only in production or also pre-productive environments so that you can compare? 
Good question. I, I, I know we do it in production. Um, I, I think we can do some of that in, in pre, in pre-prod or in performance environment, but I, I don't know. I don't know if we have the same ability to do it in there as we do in production. Mm. Um, but I, I believe we do. Cause I think there's, I think that's, you know, one of the, one of the advantages we've had as, you know, we've, we brought in Dynatrace a couple of years ago and kind of went that route, but we've had, we've had other tools in place for quite a while, but, um, I, I've really, you know, again, over the last five years or so been able to kind of hone in a little bit more on the Dynatrace tool because that's what we've been using lately. That's um, interesting that you have it on some environments. I was asking because having it in pre-prod, uh, it's a good practice sure. so that it, if it's getting towards prod, it's something that gets slower or it's showing issues. Oh, yeah. whoa, 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 stop. I didn't even <laughs> test you, but I know that you are slower because you were coming into production. Let's check why right. are you slower than the rest of the environments that we were seeing. And it's um, and this interaction or integration, earlier you mentioned that you were having conversations with the developers, something that in the wonderful days was like, what, getting together? Like most of the times when I would get into a project, the developers would have been long gone or back to India some of the times or not even anymore uh, there. Sure. How, how are these interactions with the developers? What are you kind of uh, instructing or touching base with them when you're trying to assure um, performance? Yeah, good question. I, I mean, again, I think this is the, uh, the the move from product project teams to product teams now that, so so on a project team, yeah, you're right. You'd have resources there and the, pro, the you know, the, the definition of a project is had a start date and an end date. And then once that project ended, they're gone, right? They're in the wind and, be lucky if you talk to them again, or or they're you know they're in different parts of the organization, or they're just moved to other efforts, right? Um, that's the difference. The big difference in this environment now with product management is that it's the same dedicated team, right? So it's a, you're talking with a, a product owner, uh, all right? So so project a product manager, and they they have a product owner, maybe a scrum master, and then they have uh, technology analysts and, and developers and engineers and things like that, maybe an architect on each product team, right? So so when my performance team goes and meets with maybe a, maybe a every two week or monthly meeting with these product teams, they're able to talk, uh, and especially before a sprint implements or something, they're able to get in the same room, a virtual room with with developers and and, and make sure that, that they're hearing from the developers what they should hear about what you're putting in and whether we think there's gonna be issues going into production and what needs performance testing. Because it's not always the product owner or the maybe the technology analyst, or, or you know, or even the manager who knows what needs tested. Often it is the developer group, um, the engineer group that know they know the, the the nuts and bolts of that product, and they know what maybe might cause an an issue, uh, and once they get to production, or what might cause a performance slowdown. So I think it's important for me to have some technical, some, you know, high technical acumen on my performance testing team yeah. as I can get so they can interact and they can have the right discussions with, uh, with the developer levels, the engineer levels, because, um, because again, that, 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 that level sometimes is the only one that really kind of understands what we're trying to show them, what we're trying to keep them and warn them about as they go to production. It's yeah. Um, I, and I was curious. There are some organizations or modern practices because uh, integrating the developer and when you mention also product, like having what is uh, commonly known as the three amigos together and yep. um, talk about some of these requirements, what is important, what maybe not, uh, get new definitions. But some other techniques, I, uh, I started wondering if you were implementing like once you have your performance engineer team getting uh, to talk to the developers, do they suggest the developers to do automations and do any of that? Because they are the ones that create the code and the services and know it better. Are you passing any of those tasks? Um, I, I wouldn't say on a regular basis that we we pass tasks to them. Uh, we I have scripters executioner on my on my product team or on my performance testing team. So basically, we have these conversations. Um, we decide what, what's going to be tested. We kind of agree on what's going to be tested with the product team. And then we go in and write those scripts um, and, and kind of perform that, that performance yeah. testing in the background, execute those, 
and then deliver them the results, right? And then let the product team kind of consume those results. And, and it's at that point, right, where, the, where that product team is going to make that decision. Hey, you know, we're, we're putting this in, you know, on, on whatever date in the future, hopefully, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and that product team is going to decide, hey, here's the testing we told you to do. Here's what the results were. We're consuming these. Um, here's what changes I think we need to make or maybe tweaks before we go to production. And, and if they decide, you know, there's, there's, so there's been a time or two, <clears throat> let's just say this, there's been a time or two where we've got done with our testing effort and we went back to that product team and said, Hey, we're not comfortable with this where we don't really think you should go to production. We're recommending you don't, but again, that decision-making right is ultimately with the product team. Okay. Um, there's been a time or two where they went anyway. And uh-huh. then had some issues in production, right? And that's not a time for, like we said, we're on one of the same team. It's not a time for us to say, I told you so, but it's a, it's a great learning opportunity to say, here's why we thought that. And, um, you know, when we see that again, we can help another product team the same way, but we hope the product team, we hope that helps them develop a little confidence in, in working with our team as well. Um, because and we, we, not, we may not be right every time, right? Yeah. We may, we may, you know, be a little conservative sometimes and say, ah, I wouldn't go. And then they go and it's just fine, right? That, that could happen too. Um, but it, it's a balance. It's a balance between our, our team and the product team. It's um, those decisions on mostly like there's a problem. Yeah, we're a team. We'd better fix it. It's not blaming or taking those um, experiences. Because on one hand, as you were mentioning, your the, the performance team, the engineers become more experienced. Like, hey, now I know next time that I see this pattern, probably this um, problem. But I'm yeah. betting as well the team uh, themselves are like, yeah, last time when the performance engineer was here and these things happened was these. Maybe we can even check it and fix it even before not needing to invoke any performance engineer. They're like, yeah, we know right. why this happens. And they get some sure. learning for the future, which is yeah. great that the teams start to keep that uh, body of knowledge uh, around what could be uh, and why is it important? Because that's another one. Um, why should I be caring for this performance thing if I'm on the cloud or if it's already good or runs in my machine? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the the usual uh, phrases. And it's yeah. it's really good. Uh, I was asking as well for these um, modern practices of saying, hey, developer, uh, you're creating a new service. Like it's just an API. There you go. You automate it. Quickly test it. Do a small test, and you know right. if it's good or if it's bad. And right. the performance engineer becomes an enabler rather than fishing for them. Is teaching them to uh, continuously fish. Um, probably sad. Yeah. Stop. And and you know what? Like like you said, it's it's a continual effort. We hope that relationships getting stronger. Hey, if we write a script this time, and you 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 make that same change <clears throat> six months from now. We can go back to that and maybe not have to recreate that entire script, but maybe just tweak it a little bit to <clears throat> to go back and do run some more tests for you. So to me, that's this that's the power of the dedicated teams, right? You're you're learning about their product, they're learning about your serve my testing service. Um, that's the that's the the not and, and you know, teams are gonna have turnover here and there, right? That's just gonna happen. But having a dedicated team that that you know that we're we're the same people they talked to last time for the most part. They're the same people for the most part we talked to last time. Um, and we've learned more about their product as well. Um, I, I can't help but think that that's better than the scenario we talked about where I'm working with <laughs> this project team, the project ends and everybody scatters to different work, right? So hmm. um, a lot of benefits to moving from project to product management in, in, in my view. Yeah, the, the that evolution of um, mostly enabling people because... Uh, one uh, one question: It's uh, do they have access to Dynatrace? Your the the teams can they see it if they are curious? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Dynatrace is in, instrumented for all of our products, so we we do give all them uh, access. Now, you know the, the 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 honest truth is is that the the developers, the product teams, they don't know. They might know a dashboard if we show it to them, or they build it for them in in Dynatrace. Um, but if they get dig too far in there, they may not be sure what they're looking for, right? Where my people get to know Dynatrace really well to the point where, hey, we can we can sit down with a tool, we can have them pull it up and talk talk them through it. Here's what we're seeing, and this is on this page. This is where we see that. Um, so yeah, there's maybe a slow evolution of product teams, developers, um, you know, uh, engineers 
product managers, things like that, who might develop a little better sense of, of what they could find in Dynatrace. But we don't expect them never to be to know it as well as my my performance testing team does for sure. It's it's a kind of double edged sword because as you very well say, it's very difficult that the developers or the team in general will have the depth of knowledge that a performance engineer does. Right. But when they have access to these tools and they know they may not need like uh, all the dashboards, all the tracings, all the diagnosis capabilities, but as long as they can check the dashboard that tells them your new release is good or it got slower and they can check it themselves. Yeah. I'm sure that that um, saves a lot of uh, round trips with uh, your team because many times like, hey, we just released something. You want to check it? If they can yeah. just like high level check it and say like, yeah, we did well. We are not even bothering the performance guys. I yeah. think that's another balance. Uh, oh, there's a big problem. We noticed something. Hey, now let's, uh, who are you going to call? Uh, right. <laughs> and every once in a while, hey, we like to be the hero, right? So, mm-hmm. so we like, oh, oh, yo, you're looking in Dine Trace. Let, let me get on there with you and let me point you towards the answer. Let me point you towards <laughs> where you're going to find this. And and then they love that, right? So to me, again, another thing that strengthens that relationship a little bit. Um, so it's, you know, it's working well so far, but but the reality is, is that we still got performance people learning the Dynatrace tool here as well. Um, and, but again, they still know it better in our product teams, but, you know, we've only had it here a while and not everybody has the same amount of experience on the Dynatrace side as everybody does. So still, still organizationally is still learning the tool. It's, I mean, I think it's a great journey. The ones that uh, you're starting on this um, yeah. modernization, giving them the tools because I, I personally had some experience from some other organizations where, yeah, we have Dynatrace, but it's for the ops people or something. You're not allowed. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> I'm the performance engineer. Like, uh, is the team allowed? No, just ops. Yeah, um, interesting. That's that's not the philosophy of this thing, and it's 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 good that you're starting to enable uh, your your teams to kind of take a look at it, understand or care, because that's another big one. Many do not even care. Like, hey, I'm a developer. I'm just trying to get my code to run again and check it in and be done to the next task. And now you're asking me to care about performance. Yeah, it might bite you uh, if you are not careful about it. So it's important. And all of these changes that you are implementing, I'm curious, um, how are you finding out what you need to change or what evolution do you have to do? What is this experience of... um, are you figuring out yourselves in the organization or um, how how do you notice these modernities and how to tackle them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I happen to be in a large organization and, um, you know, to be honest, I mean, right, we, br- we bring a tool in like that and, and or, or any tool really. I mean, bring any tool in, it's hard to keep track on, on you know, how this area is using the tool or, or what their practice is versus this area versus this area. And again, big organization problems, right? That that's maybe a smaller company just would, you know, smaller companies, you might look around the room and say your entire um, IT department, big organizations, you got to get meetings. There's, there's thousands of people involved. You got to get meetings to figure out like, Hey, is everybody taking the same approach here? Try to figure it out. Um, You know, doing anything in a large organization takes time and and a lot of effort to, to get everybody on the same page and you still might not get everybody on the same page. And then you, then you throw all the different, well, we're, we're, we're still on WAS, we're on mainframe, we're, we're on cloud, we're on the technical platform, you know, a lot of different varieties in the tooling and, you know, modernization efforts going on that, that, that make it even more challenging for everybody to get on the same page. Um, but I'll say this, I mean, you know, we, Again, brought down to saying, but that's far from the only tool we have from a testing standpoint. Um, we've been using Grafana and Load Runner and, and probably ten other tools that I, that I can't think of right now. But um, but I, I think honestly, I think different areas use different tools at, for different things at different times. Um, you know, we have a I, I know Don Trace has another one. I don't know a lot about it, but it's called um, Digital Experience Manager. And again, for a customer facing area like mine, it does allow us to get in and kind of see almost down to the mouse click, like what in production, what, what did a user do? Uh, how did they, it allows us to follow it. 
But again, other or, other parts of our organization probably wouldn't be interested in that. We are because we're more customer facing. But um, but you know, there could be different use cases that I'm unaware of uh, for those teams. But um, but to answer your question, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge to find out how everybody else is using this, and and even if like how is it going, right? And and you and I talked. I have a meeting coming up where I'm trying to get in front of other performance uh, testing managers to find out how things are going for you. Uh, what tools are you using? What's your approach? You know, changing over from at from product to project management to product management. You know, what's your approach like? And is it the same? Is this the same as I'm using? So, it's tough, but it takes a lot of effort to uh, figure out whether you're on the same page or not. Yeah, that's that's interesting because uh, especially with these large organizations, some uh, people that are on the other corner of the organization that may feel like the other end of the world. It's yeah. they get some other knowledge and get together and um, kind of like consolidate it and come with the best practice. Uh, 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 organizations that are so large, it's very difficult to kind of come with the best practice for everyone. And some teams may figure out some components first or some elements, some practices. And this one kind of, uh, I'm also curious when you mentioned like this evolution from it's not project, now it's product. Now we have to do the, the things this way. Now we talk to developers. How did you come to realize those changes or implement them? Um, well, I tell you, about five years ago, um, I took over this performance testing team. And the thing that hit me first was, you know, I, had, I, had, I took over a team and had this guy leading this team. He wanted to test everything. And I mean everything, every implementation, every project, everything had to be tested. <laughs> and then I had another guy over here saying, hey, we can't keep doing this. We need to do more risk-based testing, right? Uh -huh. uh, and then as we started moving from project management to product and, and you know, from uh, Waterfall to Agile, we sat down and we're like, you know, we, and, and my team was forced to get a little smaller. We're like, we, we can't test everything, right? We can't test everything. So we really need to go to a risk-based testing model. And then it was really, the really kicker for me, Leandro, was as we went to product management, the ownership changed, okay? And for, for example, when I first took over this team, <laughs> my performance team was opening up performance risks on the project teams, right? Uh -huh. And they didn't like that. It was like, hey, this is our risk. We don't need you opening it up on it. We already know about it. And I thought, yeah, you know what? My team should just notify you of that because you own that decision now. Are you own the ability to accept that risk or forget that we ever said anything about it? So when the when I figured out really that the ownership changed from, um, you know, from my team making the call, hey, you have a risk and we're not going to let you go to production. We couldn't do that anymore because we didn't own the product. So once the ownership of the product moved to the product team and they had like basically full cradle, we call it cradle to grave ownership, we lost decision making rights. Um, at the same time, we kind of we kind of realized performance testing is not required anymore like it used to be because we used to, you know, have multiple drops, you know, like two or three major drops a year. And you had to performance test as part of a evidence of test to go into production, right? You had to. We don't do those anymore because each team's on their own agile schedule. So the ownership clearly changed from from something else making the decisions to that product team who owns it. Yep. Once that changed, I, I kind of looked at my, my team and went, we don't own the decision to go into production anymore. We don't own the risk. We're, we're basically a testing service that is going to talk to them and say, hey, here's what we found. Here's what we can help you with. Um, it's your decision to make that make that call going into production. We're now making the call we're, we're, we might advise you one way or the other, but in the end, it is your decision and you have those full, full decision rights uh, and rights to make those decisions as a, as a product team that owns this all the way to the end. It's, a, it's an interesting set of um, changes and situations that push you to take different decisions. As yeah. very well you said, I remember when we were uh, the performance engineers, we had the last step of testing before releasing into production. And I used yeah. to joke that we were like the Gandalfs of the bread, thou shall not pass. And <laughs> we stopped everything. And nowadays, yeah. uh, I like that perspective as well. Like, hey, I identified this, 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 and that. And you want to swipe it under your rug or you want to pay? It's your situation. I'm just here to right. indicate or assist you 
getting the information and the situation, which is like a continuous situation. As you said, uh, before was just like here once or twice an event per year, we had a release right. and that was it. Now it's uh, a very different perspective and it's interesting right. that yeah, you kind of learned it being thrown at the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really did. And and it just, it really took just sitting back, looking at the entire scenario saying, you know, with, with all these, with all these multitude of implementations going on per month, per year across, again, my team covers 15 to 20 different product teams. There's no way you can require it all to be performance tested. Um, there's no way you could manage all, all, you know, again, across 15, 20 prod product teams, you have how many implementations per month. That's a lot to do for one testing team. Um, just no way, no way you can really manage that from a, you know, if, if my team was making the call, Hey, you can't go, you can't. It, it's, it's a better scenario when the product teams own it. Um, and, and they have those decision-making, right. That way we just, we're just letting them know, Hey, here's what we found. We think this could degrade your production, uh, value when you get there. Um, or, Hey, you, you look great. Go ahead and go. We support that. And they go. And, um, again, there's always going to be those one-offs where, Maybe we said go and something went wrong, or we said don't go and you went anyway, and then we had a problem. Right? We <laughs> talked about that, but th those are those are very infrequent outcomes. Uh, you know, for the most part, I, I feel like we provide a really solid testing service. We back quality. We stand for quality. That's the only reason we're going to put something out there and recommend one way or the other because we want quality just like you want quality. Yeah, it's it's a different perspective on. As well, I'm, I have a feeling that nowadays you have probably less of these big problems, big performance situations, because as we were saying now, we are continuous, we are already in production, we are pushing tiny little details at a time. Yeah. And this, I mean, all these changes, all these differences, now twisting a little bit the perspective here. You had to learn it yourself. You had to, you were thrown at the water and start uh, paddling and try to float and uh, find your way around. What do you recommend to people that are having similar situations? How can they kind of avoid or survive <laughs> these type of situations? Where where have you found or what do you recommend them to start doing or trying? Yeah, good question. I I, I would focus on you know who's who in your organization uh, is making decisions on you know. Who, who owns it or who, who is the eventual owner? Like, again, if you're still running projects and you're going to transfer ownership over to a service team or something like that, then um, who, who, who owns that to the point where they, they can really have the ability to make a decision like that and work with those teams and have those discussions and say, what do you need from my testing team? What can we provide to you that would help you from an ownership standpoint? And when you look at it from an ownership lens, um, I think that'll help drive you, your organization, even down to the team level. Um, it'll help you drive who should make those decisions, who should decide if we need to test or not, who should decide how much we should need to test, um, what tools we might use. Um, you know, do you need a do you need a uh, do you need a, a an alert an alerting uh, capability? Do you need a dashboard built for your team? Um, who needs that? I think it's the team that owns it eventually and is going to make the decisions going forward about those things. Um, and, and, you know, again, not a perfect science, but I think if you look at that, that might help you. And then really just kind of ask yourself again, back to the, you know, what do you need to test, right? Is testing everything a good bang for your buck, right? Um, we, I got asked a lot of questions about, well, we test this much. How much do we find? <laughs> well, you know, when you only find this much and you test, you spend a lot of money testing this much, uh, a lot of time, you might step back and look at that and say, are we getting really what we need for all the testing we're doing? And that that's a slippery slope because I, I'm not condoning do less testing, but you do have to look at that as a, as a return on your investment, your testing investment. You know, what are you finding? Uh, and again, even then from there, who owns that, you know, at the end. So I think uh, keying in on the ownership and then stepping back and looking at how much, you know, what does your investment in testing look like? What does it mean to you and your organization? I think that gets you to the point where you might you might be able to make some decisions on how you go about that. Yeah, I'd say a slippery slope to say you tested a lot and you, I mean, to me, testing is always like a health insurance. What coverage uh, 
you got the largest coverage, but you never got sick. Well, if you did get sick, you really want the largest coverage. So it's it's tough to decide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend one or the other, depending on the context. There are so many yeah. elements, and yeah. and I don't I don't condone stop testing at all. Mm -hmm. I don't condone limiting it. I just condone testing the right things. Test yeah. the things that you you know are the highest risk. Uh, test the things that you really need to get to get into production with high quality. No, and I always give you this example where, uh, especially with agile, continuous, modern methodologies, that you are um, releasing just little pieces. Uh, yeah. And I always give the example with a house. You're working, building a house. You're already done with the bedroom. You're already done with the garage. You're working on the kitchen. Why do you test the garage if you're working on the kitchen in this release? Right. And that's that's another um, interesting perspective on how to decide what to test, what coverage to do. Why are you testing everything on every sprint if you're just working in this corner of the house? It's um, it's a good indication. I mean, yeah, uh, that's a good analogy. Where where are you going to be spending most of your time? What's got the most moving parts on it? Right, K the kitchen's got way more moving parts than the garage does. So uh, that's a good place to focus your testing. And we were point. not working on the garage. It's finished. We're not touching it. So so one may say, oh, but there's a wire going right. through both of them. Uh, okay, maybe we need to check yep. that wire. So it's yeah. not an always or never, but right. you have to be critical on what you decide to test. Yep, totally and agree with you. Closing, uh, we're already wrapping down, uh, total sure. pun intended, in, in this show. I, I have one last question. We were talking earlier into some modern topics, uh, cloud, microservices, elasticity, and ways to how to test it. How, what's what's your method or where do you learn how to test these modern things or these unknown things? Because let's say in uh, in six months we get AI in um, yeah. the State Farm platform. How do you, what's your process <laughs> to learn how to test all those new things or new processes? Yeah, you you're asking me a question that that I that I still need to figure out myself, to be honest. I mean, I mean, I again meeting with other managers here, meeting with leadership, meeting meeting with people that know as much about testing me and a lot more that, that you know that know more about testing than I do to try to figure it out. I mean, we got to have some consensus on where are we going um, as we as, as we have products start moving to the cloud. Um, how do we test that? Do we have to test any differently? Are there things that we worried about yesterday? that we don't need to worry about tomorrow uh, when we get to cloud. Um, I, I don't have a great answer other than that we have to have start the conversations there uh -huh. and figure out, you know, what what do we do differently in the future? Because uh, the future is changing right around us. Uh, I mean, we're this cloud is going to be a, a, a new learning opportunity for each and every one of us. And every product team that I work with is going to have a different cloud journey. Uh -huh. And um, I think my performance team has a lot to learn about what is cloud performance testing look like in the cloud? I don't think we know the answers yet, but we have to start those conversations and have those forums so we can, you know, and, and go go to conference, go to testing conferences and find out what the industry is doing. Um, talk to experts like yourself, figure out where 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 is everybody going and what are we going to do differently tomorrow? That's that's where, that's my goal right now. That, I think that's a great recommendation. And I, um, even as uh, these organizations uh, like yours can be huge, lots of people, knowledgeable people, yeah. sometimes there's, it's brand new knowledge or brand new situations that, um, yeah, and you gave a, almost uh, pretty much the answer that I was looking for. Conferences are melting pots of knowledge or new experiences, new things Here. that uh, often organizations, um, I don't know if they oversee or uh, like me, um, there's not much need, but um, yeah. I think there's a lot of benefit and you are a living example of all the richness that can be brought from those conversations, those organizations, the people that you meet, the processes. And I think you got a blast in <laughs> Stories, right? Yeah, you know, it was, and I met a lot of really interesting people and, and talked you know, we talked to people from many different industries, some people that were doing things like us and some people that were doing things different, right? All great perspectives, but I agree with you. I think conferences are too often looked as uh, looked at like an expense um, and and without that lens of like, what can you really learn and, and what can you bring back to your organization? And, and I think it's on each one of us that goes to a conference to bring something back 
uh, valuable and share it with with other parts of the organization. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. So, um, you know, again, great opportunity to meet people in the industry. Uh, silly side question before we close up. Um, are you planning on any more? Because you presented on uh, Star East. Are you planning on attending some others, gathering more knowledge? Um, or yep. Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to make the Star West, um, but definitely hoping to uh, get back to Star East and then look at other testing conferences potentially. I'm um, just looking for opportunities, again, to learn, uh, learn from others, share a little bit what I know. Uh, so, yeah, that definitely in my plans and I uh, would like to do some of that. Yep. It's a great balance and everyone watching, I know that uh, I have a feeling that you'll be hearing more from Theron in these uh, coming months or <laughs> uh, these coming times because um, I, I, that's also why I wanted to have this conversation because I had the feeling that you found this wealth of knowledge in these events, in these situations that always, always makes us uh, grow. Uh, my personal experience was When I started to go to conferences and to meet, uh, go to web, uh, assist to webinars, meet gurus or these, um, and I don't know if calling them gurus, but professionals <laughs> in the field that are <laughs> spearheading into it. I yeah. think that's where I personally feel that I grew the most uh, professionally. So uh, that's a great perspective, Theron. Thank you also for giving us uh, your insights and how, how is it being done in your organization? And um, now last uh, question, how can people get in touch with you if they have questions, if they have some recommendations or want to have a conversation with you? Yeah, I, I'm not the most active on social media. Just I'm on good. LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I uh, can't really give out my company email address right now. Yeah, but, no, uh, no, no, no. I can always get in touch with you to get in touch with me <laughs> um, or check me out on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm glad to, yeah. glad to hook up with you. I'd love to have more conversations yeah. like this. Theron Melrose in LinkedIn, if you want to uh, send him a note or ask any question or any detail or give some ideas if you have some for the challenges that were mentioned, um, and I think could be very welcome. Also, I'm a good conduit for that information yeah. if you want to. Uh, amigo Theron, thank you very much for uh, joining in this uh, conversation. Thank you very much for having me. It was uh, a lot of fun talking with you. Uh, great meeting you several months back. and. Uh, Hope we can do something like this again. I have a feeling we're going to have uh, more adventures in the future. So Excellent. everyone, that was uh, Perfites, uh, another uh, conversation and interview. I'm going to be trying to bring more topics and chase our amigos James and Henrik so that we are creating more stuff more often. Hard to keep these promises, but let's see. <laughs> uh, amigo Theron, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, have a great day. Stay tuned. And Perfites, out. Adiós.